Next speaker, uh, Professor Ling Chen, will provide you with a glimpse into a completely different slice. I think it is completely different. I haven't seen his material yet, but I think it is going to be completely different. Okay, so uh, the next uh, uh, topic is going to be about the m and mergers and acquisitions landscape uh, before and after uh, or during and after rather the COVID pandemic. Okay, Professor Chen. Okay, I'm still thinking which, which type I am. Uh, well, I'm going to switch the topic completely uh, to something of a different uh, personality, the market. Um, well, I'm going to talk about money. Money talks as well, okay? So, and money talks in a very different way, okay? In a, I have to say, a brutal way, using Olivier's talk that the investor would actually bully you, right? And I push my students very hard, uh, well, to be very honest, just to get you prepared. And eventually, I think mo most of you realize that, well, some, some kind of push from the market will be even harder than what your professor would do in the class. So uh, I only have 30 minutes. I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, this topic, which can be carried out in three days. So I'm going to uh, just to make it very short and talk about the outlook of the merger acquisition market. Uh, in, in, in the entire world, particularly uh, like um, uh, around the, uh, the, the Asian areas. So uh, there's one very interesting stylized effect. So we always focus on the current market, but in merger acquisition, well, the deals are always in waves, okay? Doesn't matter we have COVID or not, it's always in waves. We have already experienced six complete waves uh, in the history, okay? So starting from the very early one in, in, the, in, in the, almost like the, the end of the last, last century, right? So it's the monopolization wave where you actually comes up with the word of trust. So when you, you think about antitrust, what do you mean by trust? Trust is an organization uh, that actually helped the companies to do monopolization. There is a company called the US Steels established by a guy called JP Morgan, purchased 80% of the steel industry of the United States and triggers all these kind of antitrust concerns. So this is where the mer merger starts. Then the second one, the scale and scope and economy scales, uh, like this kind of waves actually create a lot of oligopoly, uh, such as the, uh, the, the kind of the famous companies, the Journal Motor, and they do a lot of like uh, horizontal and vertical kind of mergers and establish the foundation of the US industry. Then goes to uh, the conglomerate mergers after uh, like the, uh, the baby boom generation uh, uh, become adults, right? So, so for that generation, uh, for that generation, they, they think about maybe we can do diversification at the industry level. So we can actually acquire uh, companies with completely different industry nature. And, and, and also at, this is the time when the MBA was established as a concept. And you can think about, well, the CHK Business School's MBA program was also launched at that time. In the 80s, funny enough, it's the opposite as the conglomerate merger. So it's a deregulation and regulation driven refocus. So people think about investor can diversify. Why the company should, right? So the company, when the company do diversification, it's actually bad. It's a principal agency kind of problem. You just, just want to get bigger to get paid more. So they try to refocus. And at that time, there's one type of very interesting financial institutions coming out and helping the investor to, to figure out which manager is a bad guy and try to kick out the manager. And that kind of financial institutions called private equities these days. So we will see a lot of hostile mergers, a lot of like uh, unsolicited. Uh, we, today we have the euphorism, which is much better than the hostile takeovers. But well, yeah, this all comes up with... Uh, with the opposite trend as the conglomerate. So, so here you see that the, the history repeats itself in different ways, right? And then goes to the internet the bubble period. We, we have the high-tech and globalization merger, right? In this period, we have lots of high-tech companies trying to consolidate, they're trying to combine each other and create a synergies. And eventually, uh, that eventually created part of the internet bubble and which burst in the, uh, uh, like the, in, in the early 2000s, right? So we are probably experiencing the last part of the sixth or seventh 
like a merger wave, which is driven by liquidity and the, uh, the private equities. So if you think about like our interest rate after 2000, after uh, like uh, uh, the Federal Reserve keep a very, very low interest rate uh, uh, since like the 2000, then this liquidity problems become a very serious driver in the market, right? So later on, we will talk about uh, the nature of the inflation and how does inflation affect the mergers. So these are the waves. Doesn't matter we have COVID or not, we have these waves. So I, I, well, I, I know that I have a very short time, but maybe I just throw out the one question to my past students and future students. What do you think about the drivers, the main drivers of these waves? Just one key words coming, jumping out of from your mind. What do you think? Why the mergers are in waves? What are the key drivers? Just one word from your mind. Maybe we have multiple answers. That's all fine. Yeah? Innovation. Yeah, that's actually very important, right? Innovation is a key driver of entrepreneurship, right? So when we have innovation, think about the Google, right? Think about the Google. And when you start with Google, it's just a search engine. But now what Google has? YouTube, right? And Android, right? And, and you think about like uh, uh, when I search in the Google, why they actually try to deliver materials I like. That's a double click. That, that, that's another company they, they, they acquire, right? Now you, now you think about like other things, and it's also like related to the innovation. Anything else? Maybe come one more, then I will, I will push, push to the next one. Anything else? Innovation is one very big driver in the merger acquisition. Risk, right? So risk is associated with valuation. We all know that that's the, the tricky, like a denominator in the discounting formula. When you have a high valuation, it's a lot easier for the acquirer to use their equities. When you have a low valuation, then acquirer will think that the, the target might be distressed. So the valuation can also dri drive a lot of like waves. So when I put into uh, this kind of framework, there are basically four big things that you need to look into in terms of these waves. The technology innovation we just talked about, competition and the ego. You want to get bigger so that you have advantages in, in, the, uh, uh, in, 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 in the market. And also the manager wants to get bigger because our pay is associated with the size of the company, right? And uh, there's one, uh, I would say legendary kind of acquire in the history, which is Tyco International, which has done more than 3000 deals in 10 years. I, you might want to think that, wow, if I can be the uh, investment bank for this company, that would be actually very good, right? Because <laughs> you charge 1% of the fees. And the regulation and deregulations are also very important. So you think about the, the regulation and deregulation. In the 1996, we have the deregulation of the telecommunication industries, where the long distance companies and the, the local companies and the, 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 the cable companies or, or, or cannot distinguish themselves uh, because of the technology breakthrough. So that's why the US government the deregulated tem telecommunication company, we see a huge kind of merger waves among all the baby bells, right? And also the banks, it used to be like, a, if you're a commercial bank, you can only stick there. If you're an investment bank, you can only stick there. But now we have the banking one, right? So the valuation liquidity we just mentioned. Now let's talk about the uh, current moment. So originally, uh, Angie gave me the title, the merger trend, are we re resilient now? Actually, the answer is very clear. No, we're not, okay? We, we're actually, we, we are now actually experiencing a very big drop, 40% drop in both the deal numbers and then the deal value, okay? Why is that? Well, the primary driver that we have to think about, well, uh, before I talk about the driver, let's look at the, the industry distribution a lot, little bit. The tech sector is still leading, although the number is dropping. And the, the market share of the energy, surprising enough, is actually um, uh, increasing. And uh, later on, we can see why this is the case. And also, the consumer and uh, consumer products and the services is, is actually shrinking. And it, it, the trend is also particularly uh, salient uh, in the Asian Pacific market, particularly uh, because of a lockdown of China. Okay, so I want to talk about the key drivers of the merger and acquisition market in the current market, which is the inflation. The inflation, well, if today you talk about inflation, if you have friends in the United States or in Europe, or even like Hong Kong, now we have seen this kind of pattern starting picking up. Well, it's probably because that, well, if you look at this 
big, now this diagram is about the, the Federal Reserve balance sheet, okay? So the, basically how much money they pumped into the market, okay? So uh, at the beginning of 2020, uh, you probably still remember COVID start in December, 2019 in Wuhan. Right? So it gradually spread to Europe and then to US. When US realized that this is going to hit the market very seriously, they pump into, how about, like four trillions of the US dollars into the market, okay? Basically, well, they, they basically purchased a lot of like a treasury and government-backed mortgage securities by paper money, okay? You know that if you increase the money supply, if you double it, and if the economic activities stay the same, what will happen? Then all the price numbers will be doubled. That's a simple economic 101 game, right? So they played this game because in the last game that was pretty successful, which is after the subprime, when we have a kind of confidence uh, like a crisis, uh, especially in the credit market, then this kind of pumping, this provision of the credit helped the market a lot. But remember, at that time, in the subprime crisis, there's no change in the real economic activities. People just kind of panic. But with the COVID, well, we have a serious real economic activity kind of issues. You're locked in the room, and sometimes, well, you cannot really access your, your supply chain. And at the beginning, China locked down, then European and, and, and the US locked down. When the US and, and, and the, the European released from the lockdown, China is locked down again. So basically, we have a huge disruption of the real economic activity. With this kind of increase of the money supply from 4.3 trillions to 8.9 trillions in a couple of like months, what will happen? Well, not surprising, we see this kind of inflation. I personally think that this inflation number is underestimated or understated. If you uh, consult with your friends in the, in the US or Euro European countries, you probably will have a very different answers, right? Uh, I think the census remove a lot of component in, in, their, in, their, in their investigation. Okay, so this is going to be a big problem, especially in the voting process, right? Any government cannot suffer such kind of high inflation if they want to be reelected. So then the government needs to fight against the inflation. Well, there are two major approaches to fight against the inflation. We all know that from macroeconomics. One, interest rate. Increase the interest rate, right? So then in this case, you can uh, kind of discourage the investment a little bit. And eventually with this kind of slowdown, the recession will gradually push down the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the inflation. And another very important approach is to reduce the money supply. Take the money back, right? So what the US government is trying, to, the Federal Reserve trying to do, and as, as they have already written in their plan, is to reduce the balance sheets uh, to 7.5 trillion by the end of 2023 and 5.9 trillion by the end of 2025. What does that mean? That means they plan to get 80 to 90 billion US dollar back every month. How to get the money back? You can't get the people's money back by just asking them to get it back. So what can, what can you do? You have to sell assets. You have to sell assets. If you are selling assets, if Federal Reserve is selling assets, what what the smart investor would do? I will sell in front of you. I will sell before you, right? This is a natural reaction of the market. So that's precisely what the market is reacting at this moment, right? You see a quite a big kind of adjustment in the market in expectation of this kind of uh, approaches fighting against the inflation. And the only approach that people thinking is that, well, the Federal Reserve is to drag down the economy to recession, and that's the only measure to fight against inflation. Okay, so this is, this is what the, uh, the people thinking about the merger acquisition is actually facing. So, well, the deals, when we say that the market would talk, the money would talk, the deals are deterred by this kind of component. First, well, we have a significant increased probability of recession. Later on, I will use some kind of number figure to convince you. And the second, well, with the interest rate, the prime interest rate increase, there is a significant increase of the cost of capital. When you do financing, where the cost of financing increases, 
And of course, with the cost of financing increases, the valuation will go down, right? But with the simple discounting kind of uh, uh, like, a, with the low valuation from the acquire side, the acquire is reluctant to use their cash because the value of cash increases. They also cannot use their equity because the equity value goes down. If they don't have financing, how can they do the deal? But the good thing is that some target might be of a good bargain. So we will see quite a bit of the distressed acquisitions well, in, in that component, right? And the market become very volatile. When you come up with an exchange rate kind of deal, you want to swap the, your shares, that becomes like really difficult. So there's a very interesting thing in the valuation. In the public market, as I just said, since that the Federal Reserve is selling a lot of assets, a lot of uh, uh, investors try to front around the market, are also selling. In the public market, you see that this blue line is actually dropping like sharply in the last like uh, one or two years. So this is a reflection of that expectation. However, in the private market, if you see that kind of yellow line in the right figure, that yellow line is keeping increasing. The reason is that in the private market, they actually have stored a lot of dry powders. Okay, for those who are not familiar with the term dry powder, these are the raised but not spent money of the private institution, especially private equities. Okay, so they actually raised a lot of money before 2020. They have observed the crash in market. They didn't invest it. They still have that money in their hands. So that's why they're still kind of gradually spending the money because that they, they made a promise to their investors. So they, you can see that this is actually a very interesting contrast in the current market, where in the public market, merge acquisition is experiencing a sharp decline of devaluation, but in the private market, we don't see that. Well, another very important thing, given the interest of the time that I want to talk about today is the geopolitical risk, right? I, I think that everyone, in today's world would think about this as the major risk in any business activities. And, and the merger acquisition is definitely not an exception. The first thing is the continuation of the US-China trade war and the China's like a zero COVID policy, right? So today people uh, tag these problems by the uh, globalization or the disruption of the international supply chain. And also uh, like the, for, for, for the China side, because of this, they actually have to restructure their cross-border merger acquisition a little bit. For example, now we talk about the chip wars, right? You think about, okay, so the US banned China by importing the, all the chip and high-tech related kind of technology to China. So, well, the Chinese firm is thinking about, well, maybe I can purchase a company in Mexico. Oh, maybe I can purchase a company in uh, Canada. So I can use the free trade pack in North America to circumvent this, right? And also, well, for energy sectors as well, right? Okay, so, and, and also, if you think about, did I skip the, the, the Russia-Ukraine war, right? That's also a very important thing that is ongoing. And you can see that that war uh, generate, well, that war, if you think about these two parties in the international transactional market, the impact is not really large. There's not really a lot of kind of deals between US and the Russia or US and the Ukraine like in the past. However, that, that there's one very important kind of impact because that the Russian, both Russia and Ukraine are major oil, natural gas providers. At the, at the same time, they are also the largest and the second largest the wheat producers. So basically the, the, the war between these two kind of countries will naturally push up the oil price, the natural gas price, as well as the, the wheat price. And that will make the already kind of pretty bad inflation problems even worse. Okay, but there's one thing that makes things kind of a bit more interesting, which is the increasing oil price make the energy firms very attractive. So we see that while the percentage of the high tech, the consumer goods kind of sector merger deals like going down, the energy sectors of market shares actually increases very surprisingly. Okay, although this is a, a very traditional, not really sexy like industry, right? Okay, so. The, the question is that what next? What we'll see in the next year, in the 2023 kind of uh, uh, merger acquisition market, the very first thing is the recession, right? So this is a big debate among the economists. Actually, the economist like a magazine put this a head title. I don't know whether you agree with that or not. That the economists believe that, well, the global recession is inevitable, okay? And there's like a different views that the World Bank chief economist said like 50, 50% in the uh, last a couple of weeks. And also uh, there's a Wall Street Journal kind of survey 
uh, of like a bunch of like economists that they say, well, the, the likelihood of a recession is 63%. For those who are interested in the US market, probably when you listen to that, when you look at that, be patient, okay? So we can still wait a little bit, okay? So the second thing is about the, the sector, right? I, I already said that, well, the tech segment will continue its leading position, okay? Will continue its leading position, but it will slow down and the, the energy deals will also flatter, okay? So the, the reason is that you usually look at the, the inflation-driven recession. At the beginning, commodity price will, will benefit from inflation because people will think that, well, these are the commodities and at the very beginning, it's a kind of a hedge against the inflation. They will buy into commodity. But when the economy is getting into real recessions, the demand of the real, like the materials, the demand of the commodity will go down. So eventually the commodity price, the energy price will go down. Okay, so, so that will make the, the energy sector kind of deals also going down. And very interestingly, we expect the utility, the, the real, real old industries will go up. So when, what is utility? Water, electricity, those kind of public like, uh, like services. Why they are actually catching some kind of attention from the merger acquisition market, it is because of the concept of the ESG. Okay, we, we need the clean energy and we need the new uh, technology get involved into this kind of old industry. And eventually we will create a lot of kind of rooms. As you can see, I have a list of the pending deals in the utility market, which is really surprising, surprising for someone who been teaching merge acquisition for many, many years. I've never seen such a lot of utility deals in one year, okay? So typically you see one occasion, but they're not, not that in that kind of manner. And uh, following this ESG, <coughs> excuse me, the ESG become extremely important. Okay, for, uh, well, I, I'm happy that we have the ESG conferences. I hope that someday that you have a section talking about the ESG in merger acquisition. Well, ESG in, in merger acquisition is important because of the risk management and also because the due diligence process. The original due diligence process we teach in the class is ma mainly about the operation, about the financials, about the legal. But now we have to want, we have to talk about one very specialized segment of the due diligence, which is the ESG due diligence. And one day I'm sure that we will have an E due diligence, S due diligence, and the G due diligence. Okay, because they are very different. So I just list a very kind of long topic here. Uh, I'll just give you some kind of example as, as kind of a fresh feeling about why this kind of ESG is so important. I use the S in the ESG as example. So this S includes this very important concept called the DEI, the diversity, equality, and inclusion, right? So if you ignore that problem, even the richest man in the world will got into trouble. Okay, look at the, uh, the, the headline, uh, he headline of that news. So uh, when you trying to do merger acquisition, laying off is very common because part of the synergy is achieved by saving labor costs. However, if you're laying out, out like women with six months pregnant, right? That's going to be a big problem these days, okay? So, so, so even the Elon Musk will got into trouble by, by getting involved into this, not, some, some kind of incidents that does not look very kind of uh, DEI, right? And also in merger acquisition, now things are evolving. So when you form a new company, when you get into a new board, so you see the researchers done by a Harvard scholar and then this published in 2021. But what he finds is that after the merger acquisition, the female board members, the female executives actually have a high chance to be promoted. Okay, this is a great thing about like uh, having merger and acquisition, which provide uh, more opportunities for the minorities, for the females to get into the leadership of the company, right? So this is something that I would say approach to break the, the glass ceiling of the minorities and the females. So, and let's talk a little bit about the private equity. I, I think that a lot of you will be very interested in, in this kind of segment because, well, you are, well, we are looking at the segment that in such a kind of situation where they have lots of money in their hands, but they don't know what to invest. In the last one year, guess which asset class has the highest returns? I'm talking about all the assets like a stock, a bond, uh, like a private equity, a currency, anything else? But guys, make a guess. In 2022, what is, what is the asset class that has the highest return?
definitely not stock, right? I, I suffer a lot myself, <laughs> right? Right, right? So definitely not bond because the interest rate is increasing. The bond price goes down a lot, right? So what else? Surprisingly, surprisingly, the one that with the highest return is US dollar. US dollar in the absolute term is the only asset class has a positive return. All the other asset classes have negative return. So that makes the PE really kind of puzzled. I have lots of money in my hands. What should I do, right? I have a promise that have not delivered to the, to the investor, but there's nothing else that I can invest, right? So this will continue to be a problem uh, for the private equities in 2023, because, well, if the recession comes, well, things will be even worse. But when the market goes down, at least their deal multiplies will go down, right? So it's very different from this year, where the deal multiplies still going up, the valuations still go up. I'm sure that next year you will see a drop of the, the deal valuations. And also that the PE now start to work on some specialized work, particularly focusing on the supply chain. Some big companies trying to persuade the private equities to buy their anti-supply chain. The reason is that, well, with the disruption of COVID, right, it's really difficult to monitor their supply chains in the international countries. Perhaps I should get someone who specializes and one party that have the expertise is private equity. Private equity can recruit some really good logistic managers and acquire the entire supply chain of a major company and actually manage them and sell it back to the market with a very good price, okay? So this is something, and also the distressed asset, I think that's something that is not surprising. And also the private equity, because of the increasing financing cost, will, will, will actually try to make the, uh, uh, the financing structure more flexible and more innovative. And that is why the MBA is needed, right? That's why we have to teach a little bit about financial engineering with more technical tools in the, in, in the, in, in, in the class. And, and I'm sure that uh, you will find that uh, uh, like, uh, becoming more and more important in the future. And also the PE will try to get into more traditional industry once they get into the supply chain. Uh, you, you will see that they are no longer focusing on the high tech and uh, these kind of software industry, they will gradually be more diversified into the, the traditional supply chain of um, big companies. And another very interesting thing that you probably want to keep an eye on is the uh, used to be very hot SPAC, okay? So when I talk to the people in the industry, they say, well, SPAC is that. So you, we see a huge kind of jump in 2021. And now the spec disappeared, probably because of the valuation, probably because the monitoring problem, the regulation problems, people start to think about when you collect my money, what actually you want to do, right? How can I monitor you exposed, right? So this is all becoming a serious problem in recession when people is already losing money. So we, 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 we will keep an eye on that and see that how this kind of a financial kind of arrangement will come back. I'm sure that one day it will come back. And also for the cross-border merger acquisition in the supply chain, there is a big shift. Okay, for example, Chinese companies are blocked in, in many ways. However, well, there's a kind of uh, opening up in the South Asian market, like uh, Vietnamese firms, Indonesia firms, Indian firms, they now get a lot of order from the U.S. market. I'm, I'm doing the supply chain research myself. I look at the, the U.S. Uh, like the shipping deals uh, in, in the U.S. customers and a lot and see like a structural change. Uh, lots of like uh, uh, like deals originally from the Great Bay areas and actually moved to, to Vietnam. This is something that we need to think about and doing research. But the, the interesting thing is that, well, although the products moves to those areas, the ownership does not. A lot of companies run, the, uh, lots of owners running the Vietnamese companies, they're actually Chinese. So lots of acquisitions happens between the Chinese firms and the Vietnamese firms. Right, so this become a very interesting thing in the market in 2023. And well, for the geopolitical risk, my last slides, well, we have a lot of questions. Questions that we all want to understand, but we don't know the answer yet. When and how the Russian-Ukraine war will end? Second, well, we will see the end of the zero COVID policy very soon in China. I think all the professors here are very interested in that because we have very big difficulties to travel to Shenzhen and teach, right? Also uh, similar to you guys, because without this, you, you, you cannot have a really kind of a unified labor market, right? So this is a, a very important issue. 
and also the evolution of the China US China EU relationship and the, the, the trade war and particularly like the, the mainland Taiwan relationship and also we will see whether we will see another kind of energy or food crisis in the winter okay depending on how bad the weather is and eventually uh, the regulation risk about the cri cryptocurrencies and other new new financial pro uh, like uh, products and the last we will see a very aggressive variants of COVID-19 that would trigger another big round of COVID-19, right? So this is all something that we will see. And eventually, I want to discuss more with you guys in my classes. Thank you very much. And hope, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, we, we will continue this uh, after, after this round of uh, discussions. Thank you.